All right, we are going to do Luke chapter 21. We're going to finish up here. Beginning in verse 1. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he, all, and he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. And it doesn't just talk about money. You can sacrifice a lot of things for the Lord, and uh, it really costs you something. Romans chapter 12. Keep your hand there in Luke chapter 21. We'll go to Romans chapter 12. I want you to see this. I'm not going to just quote it. Um, because you say, well, are we still, still supposed to do things and whatever today and sacrifice and things like that? Absolutely. Um, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And what's the big part of that sacrifice? Verse 2. And be, not, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Nonconformity is a big sacrifice in all areas of your life. And you'll see that as a Christian. You go to the grocery store and you say, Lord, what are the, what are the things you want me to eat? Not what my flesh wants to eat. What do you want me to eat? You can't conform to what everybody else is getting. How about how you dress? How about how you live? Are you drowning in debt? All the other things of this world? Well, I just want to see the power of God in my life. How can you? A lot of you people out there, you keep him out with all your insurance policies and all your other things and your credit cards. When you need money, you don't have to pray about it. You just get your card out, you know, and all the other things that you do to insulate and shield yourself from any kind of trouble. You don't want to risk anything. How can God get in there and show His power? I've heard Christians say, you know, I, I thank God for the insurance policy money that came through and stuff. I had a house fire and the Lord really came through with that insurance money. How? The lost guy down the street had the same thing happen. Was the Lord providing for him through Allstate or State Farm or something like that? Insurance company payout? Let's continue. You should sacrifice for the Lord. Remember that. Verse 5, Luke 20, 21, verse 5. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but what shall, but when shall these things be, and what shall be the... And what, Sign will there be when these things shall come to pass. I'm having a hard time because I just, I'm, you know, reading this, but in my mind thinking of Matthew 24. Challenging. <laughs> Verse 8, And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. Now let me make a point here. If you have your King James Bible open, notice that the word Christ there is in italics. Okay, that means that the manuscripts that they had there, the Greek text that they had, would have been an addition of what later became known as the Textus Receptus. Um, th that word Christ wasn't in the text. Whenever you see a word in italics in your King James Bible, it means this is not in the text, but we're putting it in here because we know that this is the correct translation. How do you know? Because they compare Scripture with Scripture. You see. And now, I mean, read it without the word Christ. Um, in my name saying, I am... And the time draweth near. Wouldn't make any sense. I am Christ. See, the King James translators were master scholars. Yes, they understood the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic and the, all these ancient languages. I mean, there were guys that were writing, some of these guys were writing dictionaries. I forget which one of the translators wrote a dictionary in Persian. You know, writing their own private devotional books in Greek and things like this. And, and I mean, these guys were incredibly brilliant. They took seven years to translate this King James Bible. Uh, the most amazing work of translation that's ever been done. Ever been done. And they didn't just say, okay, well, we're just going to rely, whatever the Greek text says, we're going to just put it right into the thing there. These guys compared scripture. They compared other more ancient translations and things like this, other language translations. Uh, again, they had this, this thing that they would do where they would have, a guy would stand up and he would read their 
translation work and you'd have like seven of the scholars there and they'd be following along in a foreign language translation as he's reading in English they're translating it in their mind from Spanish to what he's saying or from German to what he's saying I mean, it boggles the mind how intelligent these men were but you see they would take compare scripture with scripture and say okay we don't have a manuscript here that has the word Christ in this portion but it doesn't make sense without that so we're going to put it there and we're going to put it in italics just to show you that we're being honest. We're putting that word in there to show, I mean, we don't have the original autographs. We don't have the actual things that were written originally. All we have is copies of copies. So we're going to get the very best copies. And I mean, the, the work of translation is a very detailed thing. And you say, well, the new versions then must be better because the, my new version doesn't have words in italics. Uh, that's because your translators of the new versions aren't as honest as the translators of the King James Bible. They still had to add words to make the translation, to bring it from Greek to English in the New Testament. But a lot of the new translations, they don't put anything that they added in italics, leading the reader to believe that it's just a perfect, accurate translation. Just needed to say that. A lot of you might not be aware of that. But let's continue. Verse 9. Luke 21, verse 9. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Well, there's a lot of stuff that gets, you know, that goes on with the sky and things like that. A lot of the geoengineering and things, the chemtrails, they call them. Uh, there's a lot of fearful things that are going on up there in the skies. And then you have all these other unexplained things, these light flashes and booms and weird trumpet noises and all this other stuff. And I don't say it's all real, okay? I mean, don't get me wrong. I think there's a lot of hoax stuff out there as well. Um, but there is some of that stuff that is real, Okay. Some of it's there, and it's just going to get worse with time. <clears throat> Verse 12, But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues. That's what they do with Jews. They don't bring Gentiles into the synagogues to persecute them. They bring the Jews in to answer to the rabbis and the councils and stuff like that. <clears throat> And into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. We're still in that polite time period where friends and Kins folks and co-workers and whatever else, um, where it's not quite that you're being put to death yet, but can you see it? Handwriting on the wall, as they say, that uh, it's coming to that point where, you know, <clears throat> it's going to get to a, you know, whatever terrorist things happen or whatever bad stuff comes in the future, and all of a sudden they're going to be saying, you know, I think that this person here is a terrorist or that whatever, and you might even have some of your own relatives saying, yeah, well, you know. He or she, they're, they're weird. They're doing this stuff. They, maybe they should be, you know. And I, I see this stuff. I mean, you know, I see this about me. And people say, you need help and you need, you know, you need this. and what. Because you disagree with me? You know, some atheist wrote in the comments the one time and, uh, and he said, uh, you can expect assassination attempts on you soon. I'm going, <laughs> you got to assassinate a, some nut job preacher like me? Is it really that bad? You know, I mean, apparently, I guess my arguments are so strong against atheism that they all that they can try to do is now try, just try to kill me. You know, I mean, I, I'm a Christian. I don't I don't sit around watching atheists and and just, and just you know, I mean, what are you atheists doing? You're such losers. You know, we're going to threaten him and, and say his child should be taken from him and, you know, blah, blah. blah and he's you know. why? Why? Oh, well, because it's prophesied that that's going to happen. Luciferian little jerks. <laughs> Let's continue. 
<clears throat> I say stuff like that just to kind of shake people up, you know, so that actually they can kind of start thinking about some things. Because, you know, most people are just in such a zombified state mentally that they're just passive state, uh, you know, and you got to just kind of smack them a little bit and then, you know, make them think a little bit. Hopefully think enough to maybe you need to get saved. That's why I do that. Continuing, verse 17, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. Kind of like he that shall endure the end shall be saved. <clears throat> Notice that there it says too, In your, your patience possess ye your souls. Is that for a Christian today? I don't have to be patient to possess my soul. My soul has redeemed it's already been paid for. Um, my sins are already paid for. I'll say it that way. I don't need to, to be patiently wait for anything. i got to patiently wait to, to go up at the rapture. And that's kind of hard to do sometimes. But uh, to possess my soul? No, that's already done. Comparing Scripture with Scripture. Rightly dividing. Verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. What does that have to do with a Christian today? I don't care what happens in Jerusalem as far as my salvation is concerned and things. Oh, hey, look, there's war in Jerusalem. Yeah, it's... <laughs> uh, what else is new? It's talking to the Jews. Verse 21, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Talked about that plenty of times. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. If you're a Jew that's not in the nation of Israel yet, you know, just you're better off just not going there. <laughs> you know, be bad. Verse 22 For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this. People. What people? Here's a big problem for the posties out there. What's the this people all about? Keep your hand there in Luke chapter 21 and go back to the book of Daniel in your Old Testament. I always used to believe in the pre-trib rapture. But I just don't anymore because I, I just saw too many arguments and I, I just can't be pre-trib anymore. It's, I wish we were getting out, but we're not. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've heard that thing so many times from these losers. It's incredible. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Before we read that, let me just read the thing in Luke chapter 21 again. Okay, uh, where are we at here? Um... Uh, verse 23, and wrath upon this people. Got that? Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Hmm. Um... Who's it talking about there? Um, oh, I don't know. Uh, verse 20. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God, Israel. It's talking about the Jews. Luke chapter 21, verse 23. Wrath upon this people, the Jews. Okay. We're not going to turn back there because I want to get this study done. But one part of the Pauline epistles, you know, Paul talks about the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Talking about the Jews. They're contrary to all men. They please not God. Therefore, the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. That's another fun thing that you can use on these uh, posties, you know, these replacement theology posties. They say, the church, we're the Jews now. I'm a Jew. You know, the church is the Jews. Oh, Really? then uh, according to what Paul wrote, God's wrath is upon you. But then how does that work? Because the Bible says we're not appointed to wrath. 
a little bit of a problem there. Luke chapter 21, verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Again, okay, for the body of Christ, what does it matter? Hey, look, Jerusalem, there's war over there. A bunch of Gentile nations went in there and they took over things and they did this and they did that. What's that to do with my salvation? How do I possess my soul in that situation? It has nothing to do with Christians. Verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun. Signs. Oh yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Jews require a sign. You just keep going on and on. But uh, verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The Lord gives this promise over and over and over again. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And it's in relation to what? His second coming. There's so much in Scripture about His second coming. Why? Because that's going to be the time when so much Scripture has been fulfilled when He comes back the second time and then He will rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 talks about that. They'll rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. I mean, you talk about who's right, who's wrong, and what church has got the right doctrine, and you know, blah, blah, blah. How about God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, physically sitting there? How about that? And his saints ruling and reigning with him all over the earth. I think that would kind of convince people who's right and who's wrong, you know? Maybe a little bit. It's a very important event coming up. But let's continue. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. It's talking about the judgment of the nations in Matthew chapter 25. I mean, think about this. Well, this is for Christians. Every verse in Scripture is for Christians. Okay. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. Huh? You mean my salvation is incomplete? I have to endure to the end to be saved? I have to somehow, you know, in my uh, verse 19, in your patience possess ye your souls? That's for Christians? Our sins aren't washed away? Our sins aren't paid for at the cross? We don't have eternal security? Well, according to posties, you know, you get posties and they'll just lie right to your face and they say, oh yeah, you have eternal security. Yes, your sins are paid for, but actually they're not because you're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble and then you might lose it. You might not be able to. We're not really sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, this, this whole subject gets so convoluted and just so messed up and everything because these people have just been so good at just twisting the scriptures. Lost people... It's the spirit of confusion there. And they'll get you into the Bible and you just you come away going, I don't, I'm not sure now. I, I, I don't know. That's not the Holy Spirit of God that brings that spirit of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. You see? It's crystal clear, brethren. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not for the church. Your salvation, if you're a Christian today, is paid for. Jesus paid bought you with a price. His precious blood washes all your sins away. You're sealed unto the day of redemption. Problem's over. 
saints in heaven. Blood redeemed saints in heaven. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 6. The Antichrist is unleashed. He goes out and to conquering and to conquer. Compared to, to the book of Daniel, he's confirming the covenant. <laughs> that begins the time of Jacob's trouble. I'll say it that way, you know. It's just, it's easy. It's not difficult. But these Posties, they come along and they get all these little arguments and all the stuff. And I answered every single one of these posties arguments. There's not one thing that they've ever brought out that I have not answered in my studies. No glory to me, whatever. It's just what I do. And yet they'll come out. You can answer them. You can spend all day. You can put thousands and thousands of hours into answering them. And they will still come out and say, you didn't answer a thing. <laughs> Let them alone. If you haven't seen that study, watch that one. Okay, let's finish up here. Um, verse 37. And in, and in the day time he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. Um, if you're not convinced yet about the rapture, I mean, I've said this for a long time now. These posties, they're lost. Um, some people, you know, early on, they might get kind of deceived by it. And they might get kind of fear mongered into like, we're not going to be leaving at the rapture. We're going to go into the, this. They'll say the great tribulation. We're going into that time period. We're going to see the mark of the beast. And we're going to, oh no, you know, and they start to get a little bit scared and whatever else. Okay. I want to have mercy for somebody early on. But these ones that are just set in their ways, we are going into the time of Jacob's trouble. I don't want to be raptured before the tribulation. You know, these people... They are lost. They're completely lost. Uh, and, and you look at them. Look, look at their testimonies and things like this. They're not even vexed by the filthy conversation of the world. Most of them. They, you know, they'll, they'll go along with you know, kind of the conservative Christian mentality of all oh, the sodomite agendas taking over. and oh, you know, some of the, But you look at, are you suffering from spiritual warfare issues? Do you have nightmares? Do you have sickness that you can't? you know, control and things like this? And, and do you have family problems? And do you have work problems? And do you have this? And do you have that? Are you just like, oh, Lord, please. Oh, can we end this thing? Not for one second. They're not even bothered by that stuff. So that is going to be it for the these three different chapters, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. I have a whole expository study on Matthew chapter 24. It's an audio recording I made it many years ago. I haven't had to repent of anything that I put in that study. Um, the gospel accounts there in Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, have nothing to do with the rapture. If you want to look up something that has to do with the rapture, comparing Scripture with Scripture, go to the book of John. Uh, the Lord shows John some things. And, of course, it's John that gets caught up in Revelation 4, chapter 4. And there's a whole lot of really neat stuff there that you can compare Scripture with Scripture. Uh, John is a type of the church, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Um, there's so many neat things there, tie-ins between John and the church and how John gets called up before the Antichrist is even unleashed. And uh, when he gets there, there's redeemed saints in heaven, redeemed out of every kindred, people, tongue, nation, according to Revelation chapter 5. So there's New Testament Christians in heaven before the Antichrist is even unleashed, starting at the time of Jacob's trouble. So... Don't be deceived, brethren. Okay? Um, I think that's going to be it. Got some other studies here to do and things. i uh, be coming out with some other videos as time permits. So please do keep us in your prayers. Thank you to all that uh, support this ministry. And uh, we'll see you in the next study.